the Murphy family alone, uh, there, there's generations of you there. Oh, there was generations. My, my grandfather was originally from Ballycat. They were fish, fish, fishermen out of Ballycat. Came up here living in, in, in Yoel. And my father and all, so all his brothers as well, that would be John Murphy, Mick Murphy, Lenny Murphy. They were all involved in the fishing as well. They were, they were a fishing family. They lived down by the Coast Guard. And they used to land some boat down at the Coast Guard going fishing one time. And even back in them days, like, it was all, mainly salmon fishing was the main thing in, in, in the oil at the time. It was for six months of the year. That, that, uh, the way things are going now, no salmon fishing now to six months, one time. And there was a lot of families depended on it, like, you know. John, that was uh, on the river, but of course there was fishing outside in the sea as well. Oh, yes, right. yes, yes. There was a lot of fishing out, out in the sea. I remember my first memory of fishing would have been is what I'd call fishing, and I was with my father, and we used to dredge for mussels up at the up at the, the bridge, the old bridge, and they'd pull their way up, and they'd throw out the anchor, and they'd the boat fall back, and then they'd throw out the drudge, and then they'd haul up in the anchor, and drag the drudge up along and bring it on board. I was only young, I was only about six, five or six, thinking that I was doing great stuff in the boat, but we'd be there, there was a board across the boat, and emptied the dredge up on top of that then we picked the shells out of the mussels. And you'll you be that young, that young on, on, on board the boat at that stage? At that stage. Right. We, were, we were brought, but I mean we were only there, probably we were more a nuisance, but that was learning your trade too as well. Right, like. right. Because right. my father would bring the mussels home then, I remember it well, like, and he'd be down in front of the range, I don't know if you remember the ranges inside in the houses, yes, you know, yes, yes. and he'd be sitting in front of the range and he'd be shelling the mussels in front of the range. Now that wouldn't happen now in the house today. <laughs> Someone come out with a box of mussels or shilling the mussels. Right, I suppose the smell alone or the mind. Oh, the, the smell alone. Whatever, you know, right? He'd but, be getting ready but, to go but, fishing for whiting and, right. and he'd shell the mussels, he'd have buckets, he might have a bucket, two buckets of mussels and then he'd go away fishing in the morning and they'd, they'd sail out. They'd come down to get the boat and they'd sail out. Which and then, it's so, so hard according to the wind then at that time. You either sailed out or you pulled out or vice versa. But there was no engines with them then. John, uh, when you said you were on board with, uh, with, with with your family, your dad, and all that at that young age, what about the, the nets themselves? Like, you know what I mean? When you when you're mounting the nets or getting the nets ready for the big fish for fishing, like, you, you, did you learn? To, was that passed down to you as well? How to mount the net? How to mend the oh, net? Yes. And that was all passed down to us. You started off, like I said, at that age, young. At a young age, we brought down the key of a sarder and all the old fishermen to be there and you'd be listening to the stories. But your job at the time then would be tapping leads. There would be lead lines on, on the rope of, of the nets to sink them down. And there might, might be corners jutting out and that'd be your job to tap the leads and, and get that'd be, your, your, that'd be your first start being brought into fishing that you had to do a bit of work. And it was serious work because you had to get this right because otherwise the nets wouldn't go out right. So that was your first thing. And then you'd be, you'd be then about mountain nets and your father would try, but you'd be there at the start, you wouldn't be mounting the nets, you'd be watching him doing it, but you'd be filling the needles for him to carry on mounting. And that's what you'd be doing, then he'd be showing you as you go along. And eventually then you'd pick up the mountain, and you'd be trying to, trying to catch up with, pick up with me father, be as, good, as fast as him, but that didn't happen, like, you know, maybe later in life it would happen, like, but the start you wouldn't be able to keep, because he was years of experience again, and then he'd pass down about the mending as well, because like, he show you, first of all, you start off with a, a half mesh. He show you to do a half mesh, then a full mesh. And after that, then you learn how to be big holes and put in patches into the nets. And did you like doing it? Oh, yes. That, that was a skill in itself. There was a lot of fishermen on, on, around the keys that weren't able to able to, to mend, you know, to, to mend big holes or anything like that. But my father was very skilled at that. He was very good at it. And other fishermen that weren't able to do it, then they'd ask him would come in holes in, in the nets from Ted be and that happened to myself as well I used to do it myself fellas would come along and they'd say would you fill in that hole for me I put in a patch in there you know and you, you, but that was a skillful thing you wouldn't it isn't something that you just pick up like you know there was no diagram like uh, d- 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 no, uh, you no. just pay, you learnt to, uh, you learnt as you went that. along but right. you, you start like right. I said you start off with a half mesh full mesh and then you you progressed on you're, you're joining up the nets, like, and you'd be putting running string through the nets and everything. That all started, and that was always a skill. What's Mountain it? itself was a skill to get, to get the right. right. We said, uh, 
gap between the, the meshes, the way the meshes would hang on the rope, like that was a skid in itself. Like, what, was the, the lead lining that you put on it as well and tapping it in so that there was no uh, uh, pieces jutting out? Was it, were they at regular intervals or? Oh yes, you usually uh, the cocks would be a fathom apart, and the, the lead line would be about the same. The lead leads at the time, but then later years there was lead line, so it made no difference that you mounted with the rope. But the cocks was always a fathom apart. Right. You kept them at a fathom apart. But, but, but you, you put the lead on at a fathom apart as well. Yes. But later then, as technolo- the technology, technology drew, the, 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 the lead line, the lead was actually built into the, into the line? No, they tried that in, in one time. They tried the lead inside in the, the rope, but it started breaking and then it was sticking out and that was causing a heap of hassle. But then they, they invented a lead line, they called it. It was a lead in, in, inside of a kind of a, a stocking, fierce thing, but it was a... And you mounted that on with the rope, and that was absolutely brilliant. It was a uh, that's nearly all fish and all all kinds of nets. Well, that's the main thing at the moment. Still, lead line is still the main thing that you use for mounting. Sean, we're actually standing here on the the uh, the pier head, which is famous again, I suppose, is where all the boats came in and out, yes. and the safety of the harbour and all that kind of uh, stuff there. And this is where your your forefathers would have fished. And where you fish now, and, and uh, uh, your family, was there a sense of pride when you were learning that as a young, like going into your, like you, when you were a youth, when you were going into your early teenage years, that you were part of the, the system, I'm going to call it? Oh, yes. Jeez, oh, you, you were, you took fierce pride in it all together, like to learn. You were learning a skill, like, and, and, and it was a skill, a skill in itself, and not a lot of people can do it, like. But you were learning this skill from, from your father, and being out in the boat with him. I see you love fishing with me father, you know, and being out there and he teaching your trade underwater, you know, and telling you the signs that you'll be watching for, and weather-wise and everything like that, you know, there's, there's certain signs that you'll be watching out for, certain things that, you know, you, you just can't write it down in the book, you know, this is something that you just learn from experience, like. And what kind of signs would you, for, for weather, would you say, or weather lore? Weather-wise, you'll be looking at the signs, you'll be looking at the, the sky, the sky filling in all of a sudden and, and you could see it off in the distance out there you'd see the the wind coming in you see the white horses way off in the distance and you know there was weather on the way in and, and that like you know and there was other things then you know usually the weather would break be either low water or high water you know if you wanted to change in the wind you, you, you'd be watching for these things you know it could be lashing over the heavens just coming dead low water then the wind could swing up to the northwest but it always seemed to happen on low water or high water you know Whatever it was, an hour before or an hour after, it just seemed to happen. Course, Weather goes with the tides as well. Like, of course, it's, no a, it, it, that, like. it's a dangerous occupation, of course, as well. Oh, it no? was. Jeez, there was plenty of tragedies down through the years underwater. No, there was a lot there from my day, but in my father's time, to, to, he would remember men getting drowned that were drowned out in the water. I do remember down in Ardmore, there was a couple of fishermen drowned down there and things like that. Uh, Long ago, there was, there was more peril in it because they, they had no engines. So you were out in weather, like, and then you were trying to pull home out of it if you got caught out in weather. Which they were fair men, like. And then they just got down. They just got down for the coasters as well. And the boats used to have to pull down to, to meet the coaster. There was no pilot boats back in them days. You had to, you had to go down in a, an open boat. I often went down to meet the ship with me father down below there. And you, you'd be like newspaper to tell them that you're up at the, the lighthouse. You know, because you, you couldn't get them at the VHF, because right. there was no VHF. So you'd write a newspaper for... They just knew that the pilot would be around, right. and you'd go, you'd go down. If you, were, if you were in trouble, is it? If you were in trouble. Right. There was actually one story with me father and Mick Murphy. My father was the pilot, and Mick Murphy was the, was the boatman. They went down below, and it was a rough old, old thing, and my father said, throw a rope up, and we'll throw up the boat. And he said, you come on board. I mean, I got up the boat, was that the capsizing? So Mick Murphy was a lucky man that he was after going on board because nobody would have known that the boat was after capsizing. Amazing. Also, there was a big connection with the fishermen and uh, the all Arn- or with the Arnelai as well, I think. Oh, there was. There was a fierce connection that you got. When you could, Christy was coxman. Mick Murphy was a coxman. My father was in the lifeboat for which years. He was in the lifeboat for years. I'd done a small bit of time in the lifeboat myself. But uh, my, my brother Michael, he was in the lifeboat. You know... At some stage, even if you weren't a member of the lifeboat at the time, you could be still down there and you could be called on to come on board. Like, it made no difference at the time. If there were short crew, you were, you were told to come on board, and that was it. 
And I should be a member of the show crew as well, the show crew, crew as well, I could be. In there, I'd be taking the ropes, that was the older life, but you know. But them days, they, 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 they called to go out, and if they, were, if they were short anyone, you were told, and if you were there, you were come on board, that was it. And you wouldn't refuse it anyway. Sean, uh, like I said, we're on the pier right here, and I'm just looking over at the ferry slip. There would have been, the, the, I've been talking to the other fishermen, <coughs> and you might describe it as well the scene of the blessing of the boats. Uh, would you, can you recall that? Oh, I know. Jeez, uh, it was a special occasion, the blessing of the boats. And that time, back then, I don't know when you see the old pictures, the, the dock would be full, full of boats. The keys would be, there'd be thousands down the quay, you could say, at that time, because the whole, the whole of all was. was was based on fishing back then, and it was a big, big thing altogether. Like so, so it, it wouldn't be just the fishermen as such. The other, the other oh, people from town come down to, to participate oh, as well. No, no, you see, you see the old pictures of the blessing of the boat. You wouldn't believe the amount of people that'd be down around her. And then I was the first salmon that was caught. That would go to the cannon. That was a tradition as well. Like the first salmon that I was go to the cannon, and he gets the first salmon, and. It, you know, it's not been religious or anything like that, but it was, that was that's the way things, and you had it had to be done. That's the way it was handed down, and that that was it, like you know. So, like all the Murphy family, the other families went out with their boats. They would have turned up for the blessing of the boats. There'd, oh, be, no, yes. there'd be no one missing. Oh, no one missing. Right. And you'd want to be in the boat. You'd especially want to be in the boat because you'd like the holy water to come down on top of you because you believe to give, give you luck for the year. It, it wasn't good enough to be standing no, inside the key or anything. And then like you'd that, have right? your bottle of holy water be brought down for the start of the season and put up in the bow of the boat, like. I said there was no family in Yon, that wouldn't happen. Right? We'd be put up in the bow of the boat, the holy water be up in the bow of the boat for the whole season. And kept in there? Oh, kept in there. Right. <laughs> you wouldn't go without it because it was, you would be considered unlucky. No, it would be superstitious and that, but that's the way you'd feel. You wouldn't be one bit happy unless you had the holy water above in the bow of the boat and you knew it was there. So you feel a lot more comfort in it being there. But that was the superstitious things, the way things went. I remember one time, with me father, my mother was at the knitting in my head, and it was during the salmon season. And we were there, I was fishing with him for the, for the week, and we had nothing doing at all whatsoever in the first couple of days, and he said, just, just, just things are nothing doing anyway. But there was a couple of fish being caught around us, and we were still catching nothing. I went to the fort there anyway, and he was out in the thing, and we were still at the kitchen, and he said, he said, that's it, he said, at the end of that hat, he said, and straight out over the side it went, and believe it or not, we got a couple of fish that day. It was, it was just one of those things that you just feel. So the, the new hat that it was, it was the new hat it, was by, gone. By the, by the Somebody came on me, what else? It was the hat gone. It had gone out over the side, and when it went out over the side, we got fish. <laughs> they, were, they, they were definitely cold times, though, weren't they? Like, I mean, it's not a romantic life, really, is it? It was, it was, it was a hard life. It wasn't easy, it was hard. Because there was times when there was nothing there, like, there was no fish in there, you had nothing. There was absolutely nothing there to be. It could be weeks to be nothing there, like you know, and a big family there, and you'd be depending on fishing, like. There were very hard times, I can tell you that. And remember, but there was good times as well. There's no doubt about that, like. There was, there was, you know, families were closer together or whatever, like as, as we were all involved in, in the fishing. But even at home, like, so we used to be mounting the nets inside in the house. We fell from the window to the front door, and you'd be mounting nets inside. Uh, Actually, inside the house itself? Inside the house yeah. itself, because we couldn't mount, mount them outside. He'd mount them inside, and that's it. He'd mount away and inside in the and, house. And, and why wouldn't you mount them outside? It because the weather was, was too, better, too wet. Right. And we needed nets right. to be done. Right. Nets need to be done. Right. And back then you'd dye the nets as well. You'd dye them inside in a big pot, let the boil, yeah. and you put the nets into it. And then you'd hang them out the back, and this made it be in the house for probably weeks after. This made after dyeing the nets. And why would you dye the nets? Because when the oil nets came out first, they were white and they were very good. But then fish seemed to get, get used to them, so then they started dyeing them different colours, light green or a dark green. And, and that was the idea of it then, you know, to fool the fish, that was the whole idea, trying to fool the fish to, to strike the net. So they're trying all different colours, there might be a light blue or something like that, but they'd be trying all different colours, but it was usually a green. But then, eventually the nets started coming out, they started manufacturing the nets in you know, all different colours, that, that you could choose your colour, so you did, that stopped in the dining and the nets stopped as well. Like, so that, that's when nylon came in, I suppose. That's when that's nylon came right. in, and then you went to the man of film and you know, it advanced again, like, because nylon was... So nylon, good, nylon was a great invention, oh, we call it. Brilliant. Well. Yeah. The old nets would be in the flex nets, and they were like rope, big heavy net. But the fish, you know, you have to persuade the fish or trying to trap the fish is the way you got them with them. 
Well, the, the night in this, the fish were striking him. They thought they could break him, that's what they said. You know, and he went tomorrow, so he couldn't see him, but he moved on. It, 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 fishing was, it was advancing all the time, you know, there was different things, but the, the old traditions were always held on to as well, like as the skill of the water and everything. The one thing my father always said to me was, there's only one fool in the water, and that's the fellow that thinks that he knows everything about it. Because he said, you're learning every day. So that's why you have to be careful in that and saying that you, you know everything. Because he's the fool, because you, you have to learn. Every day there's always something different in the water, like there's different experiences than everything. Like. Was there any other uh, thing you would have had aboard the boat or uh, like uh, for, for luck or for religious reasons or anything like that? Yeah, or, or you would carry on yourself? Well, you, you, you usually, if you if you had a, a lucky hat, you'd wear it for the whole year and you wouldn't even wash it. <laughs> That'd be the case of like, you felt it was a lucky hat, that's the way it was. There was always the holy medals up in the boat, the boat as well, like, you know. If you were given something, like you might be going down and you might meet someone going down, they might give you a say a sixpence or something as a handsel for luck and if you got a couple of fish you wouldn't spend that sixpence for the whole year like you know but that was just just superstitious things that's the way it was if you got something for luck and if you got luck out of it you wouldn't hurt with it like fellas would wear the same clothes they wouldn't change their clothes because they said well that was their luck they'd be afraid to get rid of their luck the harbour out here would have been peppered with with, uh, with, uh, with different size salmon oh, yards there was all kind of punts out in the harbour and it was great to see it. The, the key here should be full of boats. Even down the Maldock, there'd be, there'd be three abreast down the Maldock, going all the way up, up along there. Like, you couldn't believe the amount of boats. Like, till you see the old pictures, and then you can imagine the amount of boats that was around. And down along the quays, then you had the cribs that you'd hold the nets out, out on top of. Every key had cribs in them, you know, because you'd hold the nets out in them to leave the weed burning out of them, and then to mend the nets as well. On the, the, the cribs? The yeah, yes. Yeah. Sean, can you tell me about those cribs? Because I remember, you know, as a young fellow walking along the quayside and you'd see all these, these cribs. Can you describe what they were and what function they had? The function was they were built out of timber and the function was for hauling in and out the nets. You see, after the week's fishing, you'd haul out the nets because you'd have to mend them if there's any holes in them. And also, if you got an awful dose of weed inside them, that you'd haul them up and the, the, the wind and the sun burned the weed out of them because they're going to powder, you know, if it got a right good sunny day to burn the, the weed out of them, and that was the idea of it. They built the cribs, and I said them, you'd be able to overhaul, you'd be able to check whether there any holes in them. Like I said, when I was young for it then, you'd be tapping the lids, the lead, at the side of the crib as well, you know, put up and tapping it. Tapping it. It, was, uh, it was another part of the fishing that you needed at the time, like, for, for it went hand in hand with fishing. There was no key that you'd walk around that there wouldn't be cribs on it, like. You'd be down above the bottomers, above the double slips, over at that side, there'd be cribs over there, bottomers key, down there, down here, over there, and the, the lower key, there would be all full of cribs. Um, and would those cribs be, belong to each individually, oh, yes. fishermen or family, fishermen's family, like the Murphys, we say, yeah. or the Hennessy's, the bottomers, or, you'd have your own the crib. or whoever? You'd have your own crib, everyone had their own crib, they'd build their, their crib. And the, the, the cribs could be there for years, years upon years. They could be there, like they'd be, they'd be, that go around, they put on a new leg every now and then or whatever, you know. But that's that was the idea. Jesus. I see some fishermen wear uh, brown uh, sca- holy scapula. Yeah. Do you, do you know anything about them, or would you ever wear them? Well, we did. Every time, everyone had them long ago. You know that yourself. Everyone got them, and, and you'd be. It was something against you, but it was superstitious because of, of, of our religion, being Catholics, that you always wore it. And whether you were fishing or not, it made no difference as regards them. It was just part of your religion. I, I, I remember having it myself. I know an out has gone out. You don't see it anymore, but every, every single person, I'd say, and you remember that yourself, every single person had them. And it was all to do with luck again. It was all to do with religion was really incorporated into fishing because of the... Uh, Back then, the way Ireland was, because it was a Catholic country, so religion was all the time being incorporated into it. And even the missions came to town, all the fishermen be at the, at the missions because they'd be afraid and if they missed out, it could, could be bad luck or something, you know. So, so that's just the way things were, you know. And um, 
You'd always had a big representation during the annual Corpus Christi procession then in uh, May or June or whatever uh, it may fall, but uh, the fishermen would always walk in that? Always walk in it, and they'd always carry the canopy. It was the Fishermen's Association, and you'd walk under the banner of the Fishermen's Association. But then they'd choose fishermen then to carry, four fishermen to carry the canopy. Everyone else had to wear gloves, but the fishermen never had to wear them. I carried the canopy myself for years upon years, I carried it. And just the tradition as well, like you'd like that. And sometimes then you'd be walking because the, the petals would be on the ground and you'd pick them up because they were blessed and you put them into the boat again. You'd do that again, like for luck again, you know. And you, if you missed out, you'd always want to pick up a couple of petals to throw into the throw into the boat, like for luck. But every lot of the fishermen, to be fair, they don't carry the, the canopy, they pick, they choose for them to carry it, like, and you. So, so, the, an so, so, so these petals, they had been thrown by the, the first communicants, the I think, yeah. uh, children, and you'd pick them up then as you're walking behind yeah, uh, the Blessed couple, Sacrament. Or whatever. You, you yeah. pick up a couple, like, as you throw them into the boat for yeah. luck. Right. You know, it was, it was just things that were done, because I said, religion was very central to the fishing, and, and it was, like, you know, I didn't say not always, but it was very central to, to the fishing. Like. So it was a great honour, like, to carry the canopy, for the fishermen to carry the canopy, and not to have to wear gloves because our hands were so clean from being in the water all the time, you know, that was the, the, the thing about it, like, you know, that's why they didn't have to wear them. Um, spe- speaking of religion, Sean, uh, as we look out here again, I suppose we'd be remiss of us not to talk about the uh, another famous institution here in town, is the All Catholic Young Men's Society. W- 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 what do the fishermen do? For, can you describe about that? And w- 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 is that where the p- fishermen w- w- would have gone, as are others, for entertainment? Oh yes, oh. <laughs> that's another. So like, uh, what would you say? Like, the Catholic Church was involved in, and CYMS was involved in the fishing down through the years because there was fishermen I was involved in it. Like my own uncle Christy Hennessy, like he was a uh, president of, of of the club. But I remember Richie Hickey and Morris Hickey when they were in there as a young fellow, they'd be sitting down, they'd come in to read the newspaper, and you'd go in and they'd, you'd sit down and they'd start telling the stories about out in the water and everything. Like, and you'd, you'd stay listening to them all day. And oh, there was a lot of fishermen there, Lenny Murphy, who was play, play snooker, he was an outstanding snooker player as well. Like, you know, but yeah, the fishermen, yeah. all the fishermen down through the years, I'd say that nearly every single fisherman was involved in the CYMS at some stage. How do you feel now uh, as regards the, the fishing uh, scenario? I feel, if, 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 to be honest, I'd say I'd feel a small bit bitter about things because the fishing as our culture, and it was the culture you are, is that to be practically done away with, with a stroke of a pen. And you'd be listening about the government look after cultures, this culture and that culture is coming, we must look after their culture. But they forgot about our own culture. Which was a thing, it was people who used to love coming down in the salmon season and the pale season was on, and people come down to us and you'd be mending nets down there and they'd be asking the questions about it. Never did I to see it happening and everything like And taking pictures of the fishermen down through the years. I said, there's plenty of pictures of, of you all people mending nets and what have you all over the world. I said, definitely, you'd be down here. But that's all gone, it is practically gone, which is, which is a shame because you all, it's basic heritage as regards fishing would have been the salmon was the main thing. It was definitely the main thing for well over a century, you know, a hundred years, maybe more, two hundred years. And then with a the stroke of a pen everything is kind, you know, which is a shame. Like they could have kept the fishing inside in the inside in the harbour, left the people the fishermen fishing fishing down its traditional families it was handed down from generation to generation. Through the Murphys, the, the Bottomers, the Hennessys, the Yellows, you know, naming a few Healy's, you know, that, that were involved in it. You've uh, the Mangans, they were involved in it as well. Like, And I know my own happened, so I did like to see it back, that you could hand it down, that, that you could go out and make a drift again. Because it was, I know now there was hard times, but there was good times, and it was a good culture to have. It's a shame to see it being dying away, that, that side of things. like. That it could have been left there. And that's why I do feel a bit bitter about things that it wasn't kept and it should have been kept. And there's nothing stopping it from, from coming back either, that it should be there. That, you should, that was all part of the heritage of the town. You know? And when you say uh, the stroke of the pen, well, what happened? It's just a stroke of a pen. They, they just got rid of it. The government decided to get rid of it. They, they wanted to keep it for the, 
for anglers. They said that the fish stocks were being depleted and this and that, but we, we, we can't argue the, the question. They said they're scientists. All I know, I remember thinking about scientists. They're, they're very good in, in, in theory and everything, but I remember at, at a time in the pale season, you'd come one time and the fishermen used to go to England because there was no pale there. They'd all work off in England for the salmon was the main thing. And then it went the other way around. In my time, the salmon wasn't as good, but the pale season was the main thing, you know. So fishing evolved as well, like the salmon evolved around things, you know. So definitely they, they could have left drifting. You are only drifting inside. I might stop the boats from outside. I can understand that because there was miles upon miles in it. But all they were fishing inside the harbour was eight nets. And all the times down through the years, if they kept it that way, there was always plenty of fish inside in the harbour. And plenty of fish to be caught. And families reared out of salmon fishing. And finally, Sean, uh, I've been talking to all the other fishermen, different generation, uh, era, and all that. Oars, boats, uh, all the different style of, of nets. It's, uh, should we go to be put in some kind of a museum or something? or, or be, a Maritime be, museum? Or? There should have been something that's that around. Like the history, I know uh, Albert Muckley, uh, I think daughter done a, a fierce history. I don't know whether you were talking to Albert or not. She got some harasses, the road, the ditch. You know, these birds that were outside where, where, where people fished for years and eventually to be all forgotten about. No one will never remember the, that, the, that out in the, the beach out there, there was these birds and there was thousands of fish caught out there. Thousands of fish, fishermen down through the years, down through the generations, they fished on the beach, off the beach. There's birds there, the, the rocks, inside in the bog. There are birds inside there, the ditch, and going all the way up along there. The upper fishermen did know more about it than, than what I would. Down below at the green hole, you're waiting to, to make a drift out, down, down at the head of the rock, over at the point. You know, these were all things you learned over at the scour. That the history, to be ashamed, the history of that will be our last. And, and f- finally, there again, Sean, I suppose it would be nice to have them in some kind of a maritime museum here in town, but I suppose the, pl- the real place for the nets is out in the water there. We'll go back fishing. <laughs> out in the water, if you could get back our culture and bring it back, whether it be for a month or two months or something like that, that you would hold on to the culture, because I, I can't understand for the life of me why the government, they can, with a stroke of a pen, they can get rid of one culture, their own culture. And then they want to look after everyone else's culture. That always has me baffled why this happens. Can't understand it, you know, but that's life. But hopefully, maybe someday they'll turn around and say, gee, we had a great culture. There was a great culture around the coast. There was a great culture in the small towns and everything. The traditional fishermen, what they were doing, the kind of fishing they were doing, to be great if it came back. Personally, I'd love to see it back. So here's hoping.